uh, and get us started. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce to everybody um, Manny Cruz, who is a current member of the school board uh, and is now running to be state rep to replace Paul Tucker, who is pursuing the uh, district attorney uh, position for Essex County. And let me see, I lost you. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Manny. Hi, Manny. Hi, Manny. Good to be with you. And my sincerest apologies from the delay. It was just uh, wrapping up another campaign engagement. Uh, so good to be with you and so good to see so many uh, familiar faces. And uh, Chris, thanks so much for teeing me up. Really appreciate uh, the kind introduction. And I think my campaign manager, uh, Hannah Levine, might already be on. If not, uh, she's just in transit uh, from our previous engagement. So uh, I'll be sure to uh, let Hannah just introduce herself in the chat when she joins in. Uh, but for those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Manny Cruz, and uh, I proudly serve our community today uh, as a uh, uh, the vice chair of the Salem School Committee. Um, I'm the first uh, Afro-Latino to serve in this capacity. Uh, I was born and raised in Salem. This is my, my hometown. I went to the public schools here, Horace Mann, Collins Middle School, and Salem High School. And uh, I'm running to be our next state representative because public service is my way of giving back to a community that has given me so much opportunity. Uh, I think about how I got my start in politics and in government. It was at as an at-risk youth. Um, and here in our community in Salem, I was fortunate to uh, attend both the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Salem and Leap for Education, two organizations that were really instrumental in developing uh, me as a youth leader uh, and activating my leadership in my own life, uh, and then helping me to look outwards uh, to the needs of my peers and our larger community. Uh, and I still remember fondly um, my mentor, Linda Saris, uh, walking me through the presidential nominating process in 2008. Uh, I was inspired by the run of then uh, Barack Obama. Uh, we were on two different sides of the primary. She was in Team Hillary. I was in Team Barack. And she took the time to um, nonetheless show me uh, what it meant to be involved in, in politics and what government could do for us uh, when we showed up to the ballot box and advocated for the things that matter to us. Uh, and that really helped set me on a trajectory towards public service. Uh, I wanted to go to culinary school. I was a culinary student. Uh, and I changed tracks. I went to Salem State to study political science. I joined student government to advocate for my peers. Uh, and I applied to join Governor Patrick's statewide youth council. Uh, and I was appointed uh, to serve then uh, as an 18 year old uh, young man here in our community uh, to work on statewide issues impacting our youth. Uh, and those uh, experiences were also coupled with uh, public service. I was working as a National Park Service Ranger right here in Salem. Uh, so I was seeing this intersection between uh, the day-to-day -day service that our public servants are doing as a, as, as a park ranger. Uh, I was working on policy issues uh, here in the state uh, around youth jobs, education, uh, youth violence, uh, but then also addressing healthcare needs for our young people across the Commonwealth, uh, while at the same time advocating for those people that were similarly situated to me, which were our students who were seeing uh, this disinvestment in our state uh, from our state universities, which are really the lifeblood for our working class families uh, in terms of getting to uh, a place of economic mobility and prosperity. And I think that those formative experiences really solidified to me that I had something to contribute uh, with respect to our government. Uh, so I did transfer to Northeastern to take on a few more co-ops and different experiences in implementing policies. Uh, and that led me to uh, the 2016 election in which um, at the time, uh, I thought things were going really well for Hillary. I wanted to uh, focus on education policy and I wanted to become a classroom teacher. Uh, so I was in the midst of interviews. Uh, I was a finalist uh, for a position here in our district in Salem. Uh, and then Donald Trump was elected and I knew that I had to change course again. Um, I, I needed to work on macro policy. I couldn't change our country 30 kids at a time as much as I wanted to as someone who was a mentor to many of our young people in our community. Uh, so I went to go work in the legislature uh, for State Representative Juana Matias and then later for State Representative Paul Tucker. And then I threw my hat in the ring and became uh, a public servant in the arena uh, and ran for school committee, uh, knowing that we needed representation right here from people that had the lived experience of going through our Salem public schools, uh, but also had a bit of an uneven experience. Um, and when I think about the reasons why I want to run for this particular seat, um, you know, I, I do think about the big issues that we still have left unsolved uh, here in our Commonwealth, but certainly in Salem. Uh, I'm really concerned about the state of our public education system 
following this pandemic. We are seeing uh, the great resignation and retirements across our educator workforce. The impact of interrupted learning on our students uh, is present uh, and it is causing significant disruptions in their lives. Uh, we're seeing crisis after crisis when it comes to mental health in our community. Um, and our students are being negative Im impacted right here in Salem with the funding formula that I worked on when I was in Paul's office. We thought we were gonna get the promise of a million dollars to a million and a half of new resources that would be able to allow us to bring in the types of support staffs that our students needed to recover. And that's not been the case with the Student Opportunity Act. And we need a state representative who's worked on that formula and can pass a Gateway Cities Education Fund. Additionally, as a coastal community, I'm really concerned about the future of Salem and whether or not um, we are gonna have a livable future for our children. Um, we are a coastal community that is gonna be a significant risk with these rising sea levels. Uh, we're gonna bear the brunt of climate change here in this Gateway City, but across Gateway Cities in our Commonwealth. Uh, and I'm a climate justice advocate. And that means that we need to pass the Green Futures Act uh, to ensure that we are building the pipeline uh, for green infrastructure and sustainability, uh, that we're doing all we can to mitigate the impacts of climate change, raising up our seawalls, but also restoring our natural coastline uh, and engaging in the type of mitigation that saves our planet. Um, and then uh, I also believe as part of my policies that I support with respect to um, the climate and environmental justice that we need to be thinking about public transit uh, as a strategy for getting cars off the road. Uh, so that means we need to modernize the T. Uh, it needs to be electrified. We need more frequent service. It needs to be more reliable. And we need to get Charlie Baker out of office as soon as possible and install a Democrat who's actually going to focus on equity when it comes to transit. Uh, and that to me means we need free bus uh, for all of our residents, uh, especially those that live in gateway cities. And we know that that's an economic lever uh, that will significantly change uh, the dynamics that we see in our Commonwealth when it comes to dignity for riders. Um, and then the last thing that really drives me uh, to run for this particular seat uh, is certainly the recovery from this pandemic. Uh, it's been uneven in gateway cities and communities like Salem and certainly amongst our, um, our people of color. Uh, and so I do think that with the record investments, that we're seeing with respect to our state budget. Uh, we've collected very strong revenues. We've scrolled away dollars from ARPA, uh, but then we also have a surplus. The time is now uh, to really be thinking about what are the key long-term investments that we need to be making in the future of work and workforces. Uh, to me, that means that we need to do all that we can to ensure that we're creating a pipeline for strong union jobs for all of our residents, uh, especially for our youth that are in career vocational vocational technical education uh, and ensuring that we're thinking about this Biden infrastructure package right here in our community in Salem and what that's going to mean for us. Uh, so that's a little bit about me uh, and why I'm running and certainly wanted to express my thanks to the Salem Dems uh, for allowing me to come here today in the space and introduce myself. And uh, Chris, I, I know we have another guest, so I'm assuming if we're going to do questions, we'll probably do a a little bit later, uh, but nonetheless, wanted to thank everybody uh, for listening and certainly uh, would welcome opportunities to further engage with you all. We do have uh, upcoming events uh, for our campaign uh, in the event that my values as a progressive uh, Afro-Latino intersectional racial justice uh, ally um, subscribe to what you may believe. We do have some upcoming events for trying to get me elected as I am in a three-way race. And I think following our forum, it's very clear uh, that I'm the only candidate in this race that's gonna stand up for environmental justice, housing justice, uh, and really put Salem's values at the forefront in the legislature. Thank you, Manny. Um, so uh, Shannon will be here around 7.30. So we actually do have, let's see, currently about 13 minutes for questions. Um, and so yeah, I'll got, Jeff's got his hand up already. So Jeff. First question, shoot. I don't have a question. Um, I've already endorsed Manny. Uh, anyone who follows me online or in person knows that. If you wanna know the 457 reasons I've endorsed Manny, just go on to my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. I just wanna tell, put a little context in about how I know Manny. Um, when I wrote the Sanctuary City Ordinance on behalf of the No Place for Hate Committee, I thought that I should not be the face of that ordinance. And I reached out to Manny's older brother, Miguel, who I knew before. And I met with uh, Manny, uh, his brother, and Dave Epley. And we sat down for hours talking about how to message and why it's so important to the immigrant community. 
Um, but Manny doesn't, didn't know this at first. We became friends a long time ago, and I'm grateful for that. But I'm a former basketball player, and I used to go down to Palmer Cove basketball court and watch the kids play basketball. And I, I noticed that all the kids followed this one guy around like he was the Pied Piper. And I thought, you know, leadership isn't just what you say. It's how you act and how other people um, follow you. And uh, after one of the games, I went up and said, I got to know who you are. And I see Manny as a leader. So I know there's other people want to ask questions, but I do want to encourage people to do two things. One, uh, to go online and look at the, uh, or listen to the forum that the League of Women Voters did. It's incredibly instructive, um, not only about the passion about the issues, but the way that each candidate was prepared for the forum. And we need someone on day one who's gonna be prepared and fight for home rule petitions and get us to where we need to get to. The other thing is I don't usually invite people to meet and greets at my house. I'm very concerned about security there, uh, but I'm doing a meet and greet for Manny I think I put everyone on this call and I'll put the information in the uh, chat. And if you're interested in coming, please let me know in advance, uh, but it will be July 2nd. And I'm just encouraging everyone to look at the forum and come over to my house if you don't know Manny and get to know him a little better. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I don't know, I feel like, I'm sure, I'm sure Manny is also very thankful. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for your partnership and your friendship. I really appreciate you. Uh, Bonnie, I see your hand raised. Um, I already know the answer to this because I've asked Manny personally, but I would love to hear him talk about the early childhood education effort that's going on and hopefully how successful it will be. So if you could um, share that with everyone, because I don't know if everyone on the call knows about all those great efforts underway. Thank you so much, Bonnie. So uh, Bonnie and I had the pleasure of interacting uh, both in my capacity as a school committee member, but I'm also the advocacy director at Latinos for Education, where we work on educational equity policy here in our state. And um, as I talked about the recovery from the pandemic and where the opportunities lie with the funding that we currently have uh, with respect to the state budget and the dollars that have been squared away, one of the things that is going to uh, lead to a more equitable recovery is for us to address the child care crisis, which is still uh, having families reeling. So right now, um, there is legislation that is the legislation uh, when it comes to addressing early education and care within our state, and that's the Common Start legislation, uh, which was redrafted by the Joint Committee on Education, um, uh, and I encourage everyone here to join the Common Start Coalition. We have regional chapters across the state uh, that are aimed at getting our legislatures to prioritize uh, this particular bill uh, for the session as one of the top education issues. I'm a big supporter of it. Um, the Common Start legislation would fundamentally transform our early education uh, system by number one, establishing um, a department similar to DESE, fully staffed, uh, fully supported, that would work on some of the regulations, guidance, licensure related issues, but it would also address staffing by finally raising up uh, some of the salaries. Um, that is one of the hardest things that we are seeing in early education is that the, the salaries are not consummate to the job that the educators are doing and they're leaving in droves. Uh, and the result is that you have a shortage of available seats. Uh, and when you think about high quality childcare, affordable childcare, um, we're talking about small class sizes, we're talking about highly qualified educator, educators that have licensure, and then people that are gonna be retained within those systems. Uh, so I think it's critically important for everybody uh, to raise up their voice for this bill. There's only 45 days left of this legislative session. Uh, and I do think that this is one of the bills that needs to get done, uh, especially given the fact that we do have those COVID relief dollars that are still uh, at play. And I know the legislature is considering them, but the push, uh, we have two great uh, representatives, uh, a representative and a senator when it comes to education, Senator Lovely, who I believe is on the call today, and I know is a supporter of this legislation and child welfare in general, uh, and Rep Tucker. So I know that they're on board, uh, but continuing to flag this bill for them is critically important. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim. Hi, Manny. Thanks for that presentation. We haven't met yet, but I will be meeting you at some future meet and greet. Uh, I'm Jim Malloy in Ward 2. 
Uh, and this committee um, worked with uh, Rep Tucker on the transparency issue. And I'm sure you're aware of what Act on Mass has done around transparency in the State House. Um, Massachusetts is ranked uh, at the bottom in the United States, along with Kentucky, in terms of uh, transparency uh, for the legislature. And, you know, the Senate has really great rules that we would hope the House would, you know, follow. And the House year after year does not get rules that will open up and allow the public to know what's going on. And we, we had a little difficulty convincing Rep Tucker on this issue, and it, it did not pass again in the House. I'm wondering, are you aware of this issue and what your thoughts are? Yeah, so I'm certainly uh, aware of the issue, Jim. And I was in the office um, when that advocacy began with Paul. Um, I think, you know, on my end, I'm the vice chair of the Salem School Committee, which means I'm fully subject to the open meeting law. This is how I have to operate right now in local municipal government. A lot of legislators come from that particular uh, style of leadership. I see no reason why we can't have greater transparency when it comes to public records, open meeting laws. Um, I actually want to give a huge shout out to Senator Lovely, who I know is on the call uh, today. Um, regardless of the rules package, um, you know, the, the personal policy in my office is going to be, I'm going to model that exact legislation. So if someone wants uh, access to records within my office, the meeting schedule, you name it, I'm going to be posting that and providing it to residents upon request uh, in accordance with the public records law. I do think that this is one of those things where the Commonwealth, it always surprises people when we're behind on a particular issue. Um, and this is something that I just think it's a no brainer. Um, it's, it's, it's well past time for us to shed a light on what happens on Beacon Hill. I think about the challenges that we have with civic engagement as someone who works across three different, well, geez, five different coalitions in my day job. Um, it makes it incredibly difficult for advocates to be able to do the work of informing legislators about what's going on and to have authentic dialogue with them. So from that perspective, you know, I think uh, Chris and I had a conversation. Uh, I won't uh, share too many of the details, but one of the things that I think he and I chuckled about, he asked me if I support like 48 hours or the 72 hour proposal. I actually said, I think people need a full week to digest. Uh, and that comes from my pain points as an advocate uh, thinking about what are the types of amendments that we might want to educate our legislators on. So, you know, I'm fully on board with the transparency pieces. I think that they're really critical. Um, and, you know, I do think Paul did come around to them, um, you know, after I think engaging with folks, but I'm, I may just be further along because I've had the lived experience on the school committee. Um, and I know how valuable it is to get that kind of feedback uh, from the public. So yeah, fully aware of them, Jim, and certainly looking forward to uh, continued conversations if I'm elected with respect to, you know, how we can kind of move the issue. Thank you so much, Manny. That is so great to hear. Also, the speaker has too much power. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Manny. Um, are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any at the moment. Erica says that Salem will be represented well by Manny. We appreciate that you're willing to continue to work hard for Salem and take on new challenges. Liz. Now, uh, earlier, Jeff Cohen recommended everyone look at the debate or presentation at League of Women Voters, and it is available on demand. I put the URL up in chat just now. Excellent. Thank you, John. Um, Liz, it looks like we have about three minutes left. Okay, just a, a quick, I would... I love Paul Tucker, but I did meet with Paul Tucker with a few people about the transparency and he did say he would vote that, you know, for transparency and for us knowing what the votes were in committee for a, against an abstention and he ended up voting against it. So I just say, you know, there's a lot of arm twist. My understanding is a lot of arm twisting and the Speaker of the House has way too much power and people who are moral, good people who go into that legislature end up voting very differently than what their values are going in. Let me put it that way. So I hope you can stand your ground and uh, fight what's 
going on there because we don't know what's going right now. They're having committee meetings where we don't even know what's happening with environmental bills. It, I, I, we met with uh, Senator Bruce Tarr this morning and uh, he said, we're in secret meetings. I can't tell you anything that's going on in them. And we're the least transparent legislature in the whole country. And I think it's an abomination what's going on in the legislature. And I have great hopes for you. I really do. But I, I had great faith in Paul Tucker as well. And he did not vote for any of the three tenets for uh, transparency. So I, I wish you luck and I will see you at the, uh, I'll see you at Jeff's house on the second. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I was muted. Uh, Senator Lovely, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. I'm a proud member of this committee for a long time. So happy to be here under your leadership. Thank you so much. I just wanted to respond to Liz um, about the transparency piece. It's very important. Um, and I will tell you, I chaired that, that committee meeting you're talking about with of Senator Tarr is, is a conference committee. Conference committees are typically, and Manny knows this, are typically done behind closed doors. But when we did the public records rewrite, and I tried to get the legislature in, and that's, and I, you know, as Manny had said, and Manny, I'm glad that you will mirror what I do in my office with what records people are looking for upon request uh, that we can make available to them. And it's really important, this transparency. But when we did um, the public records conference committee, it was done in public, all of it. Um, and it's not done very often, and it was not a hard process. We had all the advocates and interested parties at the table, and we came up with a really good bill. It didn't go as far as I wanted to, and then we created a special commission on the Senate side to be able to look at um, you know, increasing our transparency, and we incorporated many of those recommendations in. And so that's why, um, as Jim says, the Senate rules are different from the House rules. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. We need to conduct uh, our government here in Massachusetts because we're one of the very few states that still keeps the legislature and the and the administration out of public records and over the meeting law. Uh, and we, you know, and and as Manny said, he he's trained as a school committee member to adhere to public records. I was a, as a city councilor. I just can't stress how important it is. So, Manny, thank you for mirroring uh, those. Um, what I do in my office should we get elected. We worked very closely together all the whole time you were uh, uh, state government. You did a great job. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just wanted to add that in. Thanks. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Senator Lovely. Um, uh, Manny, any final words before we uh, close out? Yeah, th thank you, Chris, and uh, to the members of the committee, and really appreciate um, the. Uh, the opportunity to engage. I just have a few uh, campaign updates uh, for folks that may not have seen. So I'm, I'm just pleased to share, and it's really humbling um, that our candidacy has been endorsed uh, in the past week by several different groups. Uh, the Massachusetts Nurses Association uh, has endorsed my candidacy along with the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Uh, and then uh, just this week, uh, I did uh, receive uh, the endorsement of the AFL-CIO uh, and the North Shore Labor Council. So I am proud to say that I am the candidate for labor, the candidate for environmental justice. And uh, Hannah, I believe is on the call and we're running a clock here uh, with respect to uh, the number of days that has passed, but I am the only candidate uh, in this race at the moment uh, in response to the draft opinion that was leaked with respect to Roe, uh, who has put out a statement on my position on Roe, um, uh, also has attended a rally and provided remarks uh, I put out actually two different statements, and I have called on both of my opponents um, to put out their position on this particular issue. And I think it's been almost two months uh, since that has happened. And um, I want folks to understand uh, why I support reproductive equity and justice um, as a victim, uh, a survivor of domestic violence. Uh, I know firsthand uh, the difficult situations that women find themselves in. Uh, and I think about the attacks that are happening uh, with respect to uh, reproductive rights all across our country. I am very concerned about what this means for our Commonwealth. Uh, we are gonna see millions of women and patients from all over the country come here seeking care because the Commonwealth has already codified Roe into law. 
and we already have one legislative body, uh, the Senate. Uh, so thank you, Senator Lovely, uh, who has already taken the step of including within the Senate budget um, elements of the provider liability insurance that we will not extradite women uh, and patients who seek care uh, in our Commonwealth when it comes to abortion. Uh, and we need to be codifying those pieces into law and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, so I do ask as folks consider uh, the larger landscape of this particular race that we do put uh, a state representative who's best prepared and is building the state and local coalitions that we need to really advance our commonwealth in the right direction. So again, want to thank everybody for the time today uh, that you've all taken. Uh, I can drop in some of my contact information in the chat uh, and really appreciate you all being willing to uh, listen and uh, your thoughtful engagement. Thank you so much, Manny. It was a pleasure having you.